entering and leaving Boston Harbor and uh, the reason plus the reason that building was uh, constructed at the far end of it there's a small brick building attached to it that uh, today where it serves as a chart house restaurant here in Boston and that was formerly the headquarters for the Boston Harbor pilots technology back in the 1890s. 
Watch Brick Building with the curved glass on it. It's the new Joseph Oakley Federal Supreme Courthouse for the uh, state of Massachusetts. The rectangular building, the meetings on our right, the pale blue glass, and the ICA of the Institute of Contemporary Arts. Just open this spring. It's formerly located in the uh, back bay area on the Boylston Street, Boston. The uh, rustic looking structure on our right, the canvas roof in front of it, is Anthony Spear 4. Uh, one of the better tourist uh, contractions in the city of Boston, one of the better seafood restaurants. Slight tourist comparison. The large building on our right with a flag is the former Commonwealth Pier. This is now the World Trade Center, owned by the Fidelity Investment Corporation. For that matter, Fidelity owns two of the hotels which immediately be in front of that. Seaport District is what it's called now in the South Boston. And we have the Boston Fish Pier that we're coming up to with the uh, bronze stone building. Another fishing boat side up north. This too is home to a beautiful, as I mentioned, wonderful one on the carch. Seafood restaurant called the Donate. Uh, side of Long Island you can see a wind turbine turning over there. That's in the town of Hull where there's a Union Cemetery which has the bodies of many Union Civil War veterans. The cemetery was the uh, point of almost a, a scene of destruction a couple of years ago until a bulldozer operator realized that he was turning over the remains of some coffins and some bones came to the top, surface of the earth. So they had to stop the, uh, the work over there and uh, an organization called the Sons of Union Veterans embarked on a campaign to determine just who was buried in that old cemetery and they came across the names of some uh, covering the tower to a great extent. It's almost time for the Coast Guard to come out here and cut away the overgrowth once again. It's interesting to note that um, the hill that this lighthouse is on is a man-made hill and inside the hill are, are man-made caverns. 
was made up of fortification that was established here during the Spanish-American War in 1898 and served through World War II. This was an uh, ammunition storage facility and uh, right about where we are now, the submarine had extended from this point of land over to our left to the remains of the Deer Island Lighthouse, which you can see off the port bow. That large facility over there on the left with the egg-shaped towers is the Massachusetts Water Resource Authority Sewage Treatment Plant. This is to Boston Harbor with Ellis Island was New York. This was a And we'll explain to you why there's a difference between these two. Yeah, this is an interesting tower in that it has some diamond-shaped window panes or storm panes as they're more properly called. Uh, not only are they diamond-shaped, they're also curved. Each pane of glass in this lantern room is approximately three-eighths to a quarter inch thick. One that extended from the tower over to the left, and one from the tower to the oil house on the right. But they were badly damaged by the blizzard in 78 and the so-called perfect storm in October of 1991, or the Halloween storm, which in itself qualified as a hurricane. Uh, during the so-called perfect storm, the waves that battered against this tower were as tall as 50 and 60 feet tall as they came roaring into Boston Harbor. This is the site of uh, several infamous shipwrecks. The most dangerous, of course, was the Mary O'Hara in February 1941, where 19 of 25 crewmen froze to death in the rigging after their Gloucester schooner ran into an unlighted barge at anchor at Finn's Ledge, about a quarter mile to the northwest. In 1934, the city of Salisbury went down here just on the other side of the tower. She's resting in some 85 feet of water. She carried a cargo of coffee and tea and bananas and uh, wooden crates and exotic animals that were bound for the zoos in the northeast here. Uh, they got all the animals and the cargo for the most part up and uh, for people who lived in and around the Boston Harbor Islands at that time in 1934 before World War II, they really reaped a harvest of uh, coffee and tea and bananas and coconuts and sugar in these wooden crates that washed ashore. And uh, two of the keepers that really benefited were Llewellyn Rogers right here at uh, Minus Ledge and uh, uh, Charles Jennings down on Lovells Island in the Inner Harbor. And Maurice Babcock and Ralph Mowat over here at Boston Light. One sits on a small pedestal. It's quite interesting, but it's barely visible to the naked eye. Although you can see the solar panels there as we go around the tower, just out in the, on the gallery, this global lantern room. The Coast Guard comes out here approximately once every six months to check the batteries, to check the wiring, and to do any maintenance that they have to inside the tower. And in order to do that, they have a very large cargo-type helicopter bring a portable landing pad out so that they can land above the rocks and when the job is completed, that cargo. This way it keeps it less vulnerable to vandals and visitors who might want to get into the light. From waves or from heat that uh, actually turn the mercury into a gas, turn it very, very, very toxic. And it wasn't really until the 1960s that we really learned how toxic mercury was. Hence the reason why automation went so fast after 1960. Uh, many, many towers were shut down, keepers' homes were demolished, uh, towers were either uh, electrically powered or as uh, solar power became possible, they were solarized. And this is one of those solar powered towers. So this is the Graves Ledge at Broad Sound Channel at the main shipping channel and uh, to the entrance of uh, Boston Harbor on the north side. We're heading down to Minus Ledge now, on the very tip of Cape Cod. Uh, most of our lighthouses are concentrated in and around Cape Cod Bay with a, maybe a dozen or so on the south coast. Uh, we also have two light ships, but that's a different story. Uh, we notice that uh, the tide is a little bit low around here and you can see the heads of many rocks poking up. Um, an old friend of mine who passed away a couple of years ago, Herb Jason, who had a hand in constructing the replica of this tower which stands inside Cohasset Harbor at Government Island, was a lobsterman, a fisherman, a diver. Um, he lived on the beaches here for years. And I would explain what the, the 143 was. Uh, <laughs> that's just me trying to pat myself on the back. The uh, thing that's very unique here is when the uh, built this light, of course, this, unlike uh, the graves, is a submerged, uh, the sail is a speaks of rocks and shoals, the arm is 143. The lovers know well that those flashes tell, the old story forever new, over and over, year after year, they read them, I love you.
this is uh, one of those lights that uh, like myself, other, other of us who come out here in the harbor and narrate the cruises and tours, uh, love to come out here because uh, always a pleased to uh, see which captain can get it the closest. And I think you're with uh, one right now who's got the closest possible. Uh, he, he'd get it a little closer if the tie was up, but as you can see, uh, they show rocks all around. There were actually records. over here on our right at the end of the breakwater that the Coast Guard just recently placed here. It's a day marker. This is a reference point. It's something to be aware of. The tower out here is solar powered. Um, as we run the point, you'll be able to see the solar panels. Uh, there is an electronic tone signal. We call it a foghorn. Uh, common language. In fact, you can see it uh, sticking up there off the ground just to the left of the tower. It's also an early warning signal for the Yankee nuclear power plant. Uh, the people at the Garden Point know if there's any kind of all radiation leak at the power plant. They do test those signals from time to time. always seems to scour underneath and those walls will eventually collapse too. But this is the 1842 tower at the Gurnet Point. It is an eight-sided tower. It has a rotating or revolving uh, Lexan lens inside the lantern room with a flashing white with a red sector. In fact, we're about to come even with a red sector. I don't know that we'll see the light shine because it is solar powered. And most solar powered lights don't kick on until sunset. The area to the left of uh, Gurnet Point where you see some four-wheel drive vehicles about two miles. And immediately behind it is Clark's Island, the first landing place of our so-called pilgrims. There you can see the Keeper's House with the flag flying above it. I just asked Skip about the status of the Keeper's House. He's not up to date on it either. We knew that it was once leased to a Christian camp group and it was the desire of the Project Gurnet Light, Project Bug Light people to 
uh, gained custody of the keeper's house so they could use it as a guest house for themselves, which was its original purpose. When we came, one of the most popular keepers out here was Fred Bohm, B-O-E-H-M. Fred was on duty here sometime around 1930 when uh, he was known for keeping very intricate logbooks and recording the events of the day, the weather, the wind direction, what have you. He was at work at his desk one afternoon when he heard the scream of a lady um, outside of his tower and uh, happened to look outside from the gallery here down the water and there was a woman completely naked who had uh, somehow found her way out to the tower here. She started swimming at the beach, which is just about a mile back of, over there on the mainland, and got swept off in the current. And uh, I guess she shed her clothing in order to save herself, as the swimsuits of the day back then were quite heavy. So he hauled her up and gave her a, a change of clothes and sent her on her way once the... It's cooking on the beach in the summer months, and hear the people uh, far looking at the surf off there in the distance, and you so close to land, and yet so far away. This is called a uh, spark plug light, uh, or a coffee pot style, or a KSON light. KSON because the lighthouse service they built this put a cast iron tub out here. They would bring it out to the location of the tower, pull a plug, the, the cast iron tub would settle to the sea floor, and once it was settled into the mud, they would pump the water out of it, then fill it with concrete, and then build a lighthouse on top of that. You can see the problems they have out here. The cormorants and the seagulls love to roost on this tower. And because they eat fish and because they live in a salt water environment, their droppings are highly acidic and highly corrosive. And it's a never ending job of keeping these towers painted. And but uh, once they got into Plymouth Harbor, Miles Standish and his crew got into the shallop or the longboat. And they sailed and rowed around Cape Cod Bay looking for a suitable landing location and a suitable safe harbor where they could anchor and spend the winter. And it's right here in Plymouth Harbor where they found just that. This is the Duxbury Pier Lighthouse for the Bug Light. Uh, the first keeper was George Worthy Lake. He drowned shortly after he was appointed, uh, along with his wife and I believe one of his children on his uh, return to Boston Light after having collected the payroll for the station. In 1718, the tower sustained a fire and uh, was partially destroyed and was rebuilt. At that time, it was primarily a wooden tower. The tower stood through uh, the early days of the American Revolution until uh, 1776, when the British once again destroyed this tower upon their uh, departure from Boston. Uh, we call this evacuation day here, and the British jokingly call it the day of their strategic withdrawal from the port of Boston. Uh, after being destroyed by the British in 1776, the tower remained dark for seven years until it was rebuilt in 1783. And that is the tower we see here today. Sometime after 1783, the tower started developing a belly in it. It started to vault. So the Federal Lighthouse Board came out here and they put iron bands around the tower. Originally there were six bands. Today there are five. We don't know when the sixth band was taken off, but if you have an old postcard or an old photographic image of this lighthouse with six bands on it, you have a very rare, very highly collectible photograph in your collection. It's been one of the most photographed lighthouses in American history. In 1857, the tower was extended 15 more feet. Hence the reason why we have two balconies here. There was a lower balcony and an upper balcony. The lower balcony is where the first tower ended in 1783. But in 1857, this tower was built again 15 feet taller to accommodate the second order Fresnel lens. The Fresnel lens, the Fresnel lens here rides on a system of chariot wheels or gimbals. Uh, these are circular brass wheels that revolve around a platform. And the tower, the lens is connected to a gear which allows these wheels to spin on this little riding platform that uh, suspend the light off the platform. Uh, lighthouse station that was uh, working and operational during the period of the U.S. Lighthouse Service and the U.S. Coast Guard, uh, probably 1934 to 1939. There are a couple of lighthouse stations around New England that have red trim on their windows and around their buildings, and one in particular is Stage Harbor in South Chatham. The red trim is indicative of an active lighthouse station that was never sold to the Coast Guard, 
and was never turned over to the Coast Guard. And it was put out of use before 1939. So here we have an active Coast Guard station where the first Coast Guard keeper came on board in 1934. That was Ralph Norwood. And the last civilian keeper left in the July Knox of 1930, uh, 1947. That was Maurice Babcock. Maurice Babcock learned his trade as a lighthouse keeper at Thatcher Island off of Rockport, Massachusetts. Uh, one of his first duties up there was to learn how to operate the fog signal from uh, manual to automatic. And it was in 1919 that the SS America was steaming off of Thatcher Island near Rockport with Woodrow Wilson aboard, our, our president. And it was because of Maurice Babcock's efforts at putting the fog signal in the manual position and allowing it to operate continuously that Woodrow Wilson's ship, the SS America, avoided crashing on the Londoner Reef off of Rockport, Massachusetts. That's where Skip comes in the picture. He was a very good friend of Ken Black's. And the building immediately to the right is the fog signal building, which has an electric eye. That's a German innovation developed by a German scientist just prior to World War II. It sends out a signal, a flashing light, and it has a mirror on the back side of it that collects light. So if the light reflects back at a certain period of time, the fog signal will kick on automatically. Now the fog signal is positioned in an area called the Ghost Walk. There is a geographic or an atmospheric anomaly here at Boston Lake that if you are standing on right at the base of the tower and looking due east, and if you're on a boat offshore, no matter how loud that fog signal is, you cannot hear it. Yet if you get one or two degrees to the left or to the right, you can hear that fog signal. Nobody can explain it. But at one point, back about 1890, there was a massive foghorn that was built out here that was uh, staffed by a group of scientists from MIT. Now imagine this, this is a little four acre island. There are three keepers, three wives, 17 children, and approximately 20 scientists living on this island uh, that are trying to experiment with this gigantic fog signal. The fog signal was so big that if a person stood on top of one, three men stood one on top of each other on their shoulders, they would not be able to, uh, to reach the top of the foghorn, that that horn was so big. Whoa. And the, the concussion blast from it was so powerful that if a seagull flew across the face of a horn, when it was going off, it would blow the seagull out of the air. It was then that they started incorporating um, fog bells at various stations that were operated by tidal mechanisms and by wind. And some keepers even had their dogs trained to pull the land, lanyards on the fog signals to sound them. So this is the 1783 tower with the 1857 edition atop it with the second order for Nell Lens. This is Boston Light, the grandfather of all lighthouses in the U.S.
directly ahead of us now. There's a tall building with a large antenna on top of it. That is one financial center. The building with the horizontal windows is the Federal Reserve Bank. And over to the right with uh, those clusters of buildings, there's one that appears to be very dark brown. That's the former Bank of Boston, now the Bank of America. And to its right is International Place, which is primarily offices that are owned by the State Street Investment Corporation and some lawyers have offices in those buildings as well. I was in the top floor of one of those buildings a few years ago on some business and I was just amazed at the view of the harbor from there. Needless to say, it was breathtaking. <laughs>